hardly a topic for laughing at. G'day folks, welcome to today's show. Today I'm speaking to a very special guest and a great friend of mine, Mr. Jason Rouse, a Canadian comic who currently resides in Austin, Texas, who I met in the UK many years ago. Uh, we've had many adventures throughout Europe, throughout metal festivals. He's a big metal fan as well. And he's also a movie star sometimes, which we'll talk about that. His comedy is pretty wild and uh, he's been banned like me quite a few times. So this is going to be a fun conversation. So please welcome to the show, my great friend, Mr. Jason Rouse. <laughs> Wish I had a smoke machine coming up through the bottom, you know. So why, man? It seems, it seems uh, this is the uh, Spinal Tap without the music, which <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, they are in production right now to do the second Spinal Tap movie. The second Spinal Tap movie? Yeah, they're doing a sequel to it. A sequel? A All these years later. Like, I hope they're coming up as like a washed up rock band. That's got to be the deal. they <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, 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 like, like they can't guys, believe it's over. Yeah, they can't believe. Like, basically, maybe they're they are right. basically on like the Rolling Stones and guys that are still out there wheeling themselves around. Although Judas Priest is pulling it off, all right, with their new album. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that album's great. The new album's yeah, yeah. excellent. No, I, I'm pretty stoked. In fact, I've got. Uh, they're playing in Copenhagen when I'm in there, like the last Wednesday of June, which is great because going a new uh shows like that on a weekday you get a different audience because the og fans have to work so now you've got the new fans and people who are just unemployed <laughs> so <laughs> Which, it's a little more rambunctious a little more rambunctious people, people, are, more un about people are unemployed but not 90 percent of the world's planet these days the world's yeah. planet 90 percent of the world i think it was a, a yeah we were, the world's planet what what what, what, what did, I've been on too much soda water, folks. It's a new Marvel uh, movie. It's a takeoff from the Avengers, the world's planet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, here we are. Yeah. We're going to talk about – who knows what we're going to talk about today. Well, we keep, we're going to talk we, about We keep getting everything. flagged by YouTube for being naughty. I don't know what it is. You know, I, I, I watch these other channels where everybody's just dropping Fs and dropping this, and, you know, we just say bottom, and apparently we're, we're naughty. So we're going to try and keep the profanities down, it's, which is difficult being an Australian as they just drop out of my mouth. And and you being a bit of a Canadian, Yobbo, you know, well, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. So, and so why don't we introduce you to, to, the, to the listening audience? Uh, where'd you grow up? How'd you start comedy? That's what I like to do. You know, how did you get into comedy? Some people get into it just like I was into bands first and then comedy, but some people wanted to do it since they were like eight or something. So why don't you give us a rundown on how, how you got drawn towards the stage? Well, you know, I was born December 31st, 71, in a, uh, a very industrial uh, city, the city of Hamilton, which is what I've been told is the Pittsburgh of Canada. Uh, steel mill. If you've ever seen the movie Gummo, oh, I have seen the movie Gummo in the 80s. I saw it, uh, it was a lot like that. When I saw that movie, I'm like, Is this a documentary about me and my friends? Like, I still, I still remember him sitting in the bathtub eating spaghetti bolognese off that soap rack and shooting BB guns into that old woman's foot when she was in a coma or something. And I, I clearly realized how truthful that was to my life in the sense that. Friends of I that I had shown that movie to were laughing at the kid eating spaghetti in the bathtub. Where I was like, "Yeah, I've eaten spaghetti in the bathtub." <laughs> I clearly grew up on a different lane on the in the middle of the track, supposed on the wrong side. Uh, born in Hamilton, seventy one, and then you know, to stay up late and watch television when your parents were either out late or you had a, a babysitter that was cool. You got to watch late night television. So mainly the first thing you'd get was the talk shows, late night talk shows. And always they had stand-up comedians on those. And then after that, after midnight, was the A&E at the Improvs, all these American stand-up specials and uh, weekly com stand-up comedy shows. And um, then... That that planted seed. I like the idea of being your own boss and kind of doing everything with nothing but a spotlight and a microphone. So the time I was, uh, you know, 15, um, 
acting out and making your friends laugh was a very good way to survive uh, beatings from local bullies and stuff. Yeah. You know, you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hijack a lot of, you know, I diffused and, and in, in fact caused a lot of violence from shoot my mouth off. Um, so immediately I found that the downtown core of kids that I'd hang out with at the skate parks or at the mall and stuff like that it was like this roving traveling audience that I had. So I was kind of like, okay, let's make my friends laugh. And uh, with the most grotesque, well, the, the only thing that impressed those group of kids because they were savages was scandalous comedic behavior. Anything from local vandalism um, to harassing the police and everything in between. So I started to get a taste for the attention of being a shit for the most part. A, 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 a pain in the arse, as, as they'd say. Well, I spoke to, uh, sorry to interrupt, I spoke to Arj Barker the other day, and like, because he grew up in the States, and he said the same thing, because you'd see these late night shows where they have stand up comedians. See, I was in Australia. No one showed stand up comedians in Australia. No. No, very, that's, very, very, very Canadian, North American thing, you know? For sure. And that was the thing. We had, you know, American sitcoms and uh, British. Uh, sketch comedy shows. It's exactly so the, the same as Australia. We got we got tons of American stuff, tons of British stuff. Where the British didn't get the American stuff, and the British didn't get the American stuff. You know? Yes, yes. So we came in. That's why you've had so many great Canadian comics either reside or pass through uh, the UK, yeah. and not to mention always the guys that were from Canada living in London. It was Australia, Australia. Mate, I just got back from Australia, and I always was uh, new from the comedians that I'd worked with from Australia, like yourself and, and Jim and Brendan. And um, where's Ben Hurley from? Is he New, new Zealand? He's New Zealand. This is Jim Jeffries and uh, Brendan Burns, by the way, folks. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was a nest, and I, I don't know if it was the exchange rate or just the general. Um, Australians and Canadians go they always come together it's 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 as you you know it's not just the exchange rate you know if, from my perspective anyway one we're both in these massive countries continent country huge drive 10 hours to do anything secondly <laughs> Australia was just like it doesn't like art it wasn't interested in comedy it didn't it didn't facilitate for you to do anything right and then and you got small populations what the, the Canada was what back then 30 million yeah, I think my hometown probably around that time was around three hundred thousand people. Now it's probably probably seven hundred thousand people. Just yeah, in twenty and just the whole country with these huge land masses with no one on them. And then they I, they, they prefer I, sport over over art. You know. Yeah, because the sport was the only time you got to meet with a guy's village, sixteen hours drive away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the families would play hockey just to keep the inbreeding together. You'd have to the guy's <laughs> wife from the group, okay? already dropped an f bomb. Are we past five minutes? Damn! <laughs> Damn it! We're so close. <laughs> we're so close. We we're, we're going to be the cleanest podcast in the in the world. Steve's Bye. clean podcast. It's me and Steve are just two guys in clown shoes walking through landmines. That's the, yeah. our whole life. It's just all that. We're just, yeah, you ever yeah. see someone trying to tiptoe with a size 37 clown shoe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's, like, that's like doing stand-up comedy these days. Oh, yeah. you know, it's I, uh, just make sure we don't say anything about that. I oh, hope you're yeah. happy with yourselves, hey, you little PC foot soldiers ruining a, a, a sacred art of comedy. And and without interrupting, as I'm, you're the guest and you should be speaking, but, you know, you, I don't think these people really understand the importance of comedy. Like like to to synthesize the shadow world and the dark by making light of, of of horror and treachery and 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 tragedy, you know, so that what so that you can why if God exists, he th he said, well, there's going to be a lot of tears on that planet, so you better give them laughter as well to counterbalance, you know. So they they don't even know what a, what a, what a by getting all upset and, and saying they're offended and wanting to stop all this and. 
And I'm not saying it's just them. I mean, the, the, the authorities have brought it into you that you're, but you're just the, the little foot soldiers that help them, help them bring it about. And you, and you, and you're not moral. You're actually destroying an innate, very supremely important part of human nature for survival. It's a great, great way for people to connect. Secondary Fantastic. to music, music, you know, music. You don't, you know, people hear melodies and it moves you. And you did. I, there's a lot of songs I've tapped my foot to that I didn't know what the words were. Oh yeah, just because it, it moved me. And I found that comedy. That's why I traveled so much, and that's why this map behind me is so important. Is I didn't want to grow up ignorant. I wanted to go and meet some people, and I knew the best way to uh, get rid of the ignorant stereotype. Because my, like I said, Hamilton was like Pittsburgh. It was aggressively angry, hateful place, and uh, I was getting a lot of reports on people and and culture from a bunch of people who'd never left the city. So I found that uh, if I was going to learn anything about anybody, I'd have to go to knock on their door. Yeah, so I made totally. an effort to travel and go and find out, oh, yeah, they do have a McDonald's in Dubai. And you know what? This isn't bad at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I would never eat a hamburger from a fast food chain, but I will in, in Dubai just for the experience. Um, and that's what it was. I learned... It put a lot of things at ease too by traveling and, and forcing myself into all kinds of places that I, you know, I was always like, well, who's who brought this guy? He's not supposed to be here. Well, I'm actually, I'm here on a, a I'm performing here. Really? This should be good. <clears throat> I don't know how many times I walked in where an event where I was performing at. In fact, uh, I, um, I, I was fortunate enough. I, to perf I was at the improv performing, and Drew Carey was there, the host of The Price is Right. And I did some filthy street joke, more or less. Which improv is this? Sorry, is this in the States? Or? Yeah, this is in Melrose Avenue, the, Holly the Hollywood improv. Right, right. And Drew Carey goes, Oh, man, that was great. That was great. If you ever want to come down to The Price is Right, you let me know. But as a guest, you can't compete, but I'll get you great seats in the front, and you can come out and take pictures out and i went down the price is right and the one of the grips the guy with the ponytail he looked like he looked like the drummer for tool he goes you're definitely not getting on the price is right tonight he goes <laughs> and Drew, my guests <laughs> because everyone's all in there ah freaking out and then this one dracula is the camera pans over and it's just cow chocula sitting there <laughs> um uh, and what, I, I, and what's I, funny I, is when you, when you said you know traveling will break up some of your own ignorance. There's another part I like to say to these modern children that that, that, that think it's so racist now, and it's so, it's so, you know, it's the, 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 the oppression against minorities and all that. I'm, I sometimes get, do you want to come back to the 70s? Right, right. It's much better now. And also part of that is what, traveling. No one used to travel. When I grew up in Australia, no one traveled. It was a thousand bucks to get on a plane to go to Melbourne. Right. Yeah. And so, so don't you even realize when when people started to travel more, and then they get, and you might be a bit of an ignorant yobbo, and then you got to, you went to Thailand, and you realize that oh, they're, they're pretty good people, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah, you know, <laughs> three, yeah, yeah. Right. So people started to change and, their attitudes. Why they traveled more? They went right. Excellent. You know, let's go over here. No, I had a great time actually. I met all these time and these blokes. We had a great time. They're friendly and offered me beers and that. You know, and now a bit of their ignorance is gone. You know. And on top of that, in some cases, sometimes one of the, the opposite party doesn't speak a lick of English. You've yep. been doing modern. And they're like, bar. And then you, all of a sudden you spend a week with these guys and no one spoke a word of English and you've laughed and had everything else in between. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. Sure. Yeah. No, uh, that, that, and it's intoxicating. You find yourself in places and situations that uh, you never thought you'd. You know, I was I was in Finland one night. No one's a bunch of guys. None of them spoke English. Were up there, but everyone's just doing band logos in the snow. Go yeah, on. <laughs> Slayer, Metallica, and all this. Yeah. Like, yeah. And uh, and and both people are probably t still talking about that night about how we pissed Metallica logos into a snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 when did you uh? So then you thought, great, I'm going to be a bit of a, a, a larrikin and make people laugh so I don't get 
don't get beaten. So, so then did you start to look into comedy? Did you get the inspiration from other comedians? I did. I did. You know, as soon as Jim Carrey, I knew that Jim Carrey and that area of Canada had John Candy, Jim Carrey, Mike Myers, uh, and then north of that, Dan Aykroyd. There was a hub. I was like, I, I, I started to pay attention to Hollywood celebrities, and then I was, they would say, that guy's from Canada, Michael J. Fox. You know, there was a list, and I'm like, holy shit. You you can pursue this to a level of uh, award-winning performances, and Jim being growing up in a town neighboring mine and seeing his A&E biography, um, which I must have watched. It was kind of my playbook for probably the first three years of my career was – Okay, you 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 get kicked out of school. You go to open mics for as many years forever as many times as you can. Then people think you're good enough to put you on TV, and then you kind of work in from performing live and getting being a professional performer. So I didn't I had no idea that all my family were all work, steel factory workers. You know, there was no no one was getting into tap dance in my family. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> No, it's, you like, know, it's, like, it's like where I grew up. I was talking to my buddy on Liverpool at the moment. I, you know, I know him since the eighties. He was talking about how he didn't, you know, you better off going to TAFE, which is where you learn to become an electrician or a plumber, you know, tradesman, which is what your your society functions on. But they like tricked everybody into going to university and get into debt before they even try and get a home loan they can't afford. And I thought to myself, where we grew up, no one even pondered going to university. No, that and that that didn't cross my consciousness, right? No, if you, you know, I'm the only person in my family that has a, a, I'm a college graduate. I never graduated high school. Um, everybody knew, like no one graduated high school. You just. Uh, I left as soon as I could. Man. Yeah, they, uh, my principal actually in high school called me into the office and says, listen, you've been here. This is, you're coming up on your fifth year. How many credits do you think you need to graduate? And I'm like, 36. He goes, you have 21, okay? It's over. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't just keep going to high school. But I was working on my shtick. I was yeah, like, yeah. class, how can I systematically disrupt the system through every classroom? It got to a point where there was a, a, a line of teachers that were all had the same complaints, which was old silly pants over here. <laughs> so even at school you were thinking about doing comedy because I wasn't even pondering it. So yeah, like I said, that those early Jim Carrey appearances on the Arsene Hall show, and then once in Living Color. I was about I was about to ask you, what is this the first time I saw Jim Carrey and in Living Color? Yeah, that changed was, my was life. It, was that with the black guys? All black cast. Yeah, all him. black. And then I saw him, and then the first time I saw him, he had like a leopard skin bikini on and his hair in oh. pigtails. Well, that was the thing. We at every party, we would all do Jim Carrey. Ah, next thing you know, you're making fish sticks. Ah. Well, he definitely you know, stood out because I remember just seeing you at by the skit. I don't even know how I saw that show, but I, I just thought, who's this guy? Yeah, this, this guy's out of control. <laughs> Excellent. It was great, and and uh, you know, Dumb and Dumber. I really enjoyed the fact that. Jim had a background in stand up, yet his physical slapstick was yeah, yeah. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton level physical comedy with impeccable timing and originality and and just it just changed my life. I was like, oh, you can do all you can incorporate everything that you might even be close to good at and bring it into a single performance. And um after my first show. Which I, when I, because I, my home life in my hometown, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, I don't know what you, what the wave of it was. You probably got it about five years later in Australia, but a uh, pill epidemic. So all my friends that went from being professional athletes and artists are now pill addicts mm. through pharmaceutical drugs from um tylenols all the way up to you know the the real mean stuff and no, no, uh, i would i would never take that stuff ever i've partied no. me and you have partied but i would never no 
I would never. That's where we're old fashioned. Yeah. And we're like, what is. Anyway, long story short, I decided to move to Vancouver and do change everything except my name. And um, it was funny. I went down to the local comedy club to find out how to what an amateur night was and how to get on it. And um, so what year would had, this be? Sorry, what year would this be? I moved to Vancouver in uh, um, spring of 93. OK, cool. And I started comedy in 96. In fact, Seth Rogen. Um, that's about that's about when I started, 96. 96, okay. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I was in bands from 82, 83 to 1999, really. I was yeah. doing what, what are you, 53? 50, no, 57. You're 57. You look great. You look 53. <laughs> <laughs> you look 55, Steve. Great. Yeah, you look great. You look great. No, and the, the burden of not having anybody, yeah, father any children or having, well, having, a, having, having jobs you don't hate helps totally people i uh, you know uh always constantly thinking about how i look probably relatively 10 years younger than most of my friends um you know diet and exercise you know what i mean like work hard play hard a lot of guys don't do that you know and they their bodies collapse on them through just ritually abuse through just not sleeping and exercising but um you know we always walk we walked and the traveling too you got to be physical oh yeah right. um but yeah i started so i've been comedy in vancouver did my first show on an open mic and just had this kind of like as soon as i come through the curtain it was like a baptism and and uh, rubber chickens and whoopee cushions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 I'm going to be a professional idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I was like, I can do this. I can do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, I, man. yeah I was a, a, such a relief. I adopted a whole new pile of anxiety and problems that I generally cared about, which was how can I do this to the best of my ability? Uh, as long as I can. And uh, I was told very early on uh, by a friend and uh, mentor that it, it this thing is not a race. It's a marathon. Because I was very ambitious. Okay, goals, 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 goals. Like, I, I, I got to do this. Whatever opportunities, I had to make myself productive and completely submersed into this. And then um, I just overextended myself to a degree where I was uh, – I was sick and depressed. I'm like, I'm in a five star hotel in Hong Kong, and I'm totally bummed out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I so I had to reset from, uh, and especially Los Angeles. Once I moved to Hollywood, I was like, I got to get out of here. You know what I mean? This place is probably. Which is I, this, but, 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 sorry, moving to Hollywood is that moving to Hollywood recently, or because because I met you in the UK, so you've done all the UK before you went to Hollywood. Yeah. So, so when I moved to England. Um, so how long I were you doing it, comedy in Canada before you went to the UK? You started in 96, sorry. Six, and then I moved to England in 2000, December 2006. Oh, okay. So, you got there a few years after me then, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got. Uh, yeah, yeah, you had been there. I'm sure you've been already been there. Uh, oh, when six did you years. 2000, 2000, I got there. 1999, I moved to, I moved to uh, Ireland, and then I moved to the UK with Glenn Wool, another Canadian com comedian we both know. and. Uh, I love Glenn Wall. Oh, yeah, goodness. he's coming Glenn. on. If I, once we get, he's coming out to do some shows out here. So we're going to get him on the podcast when he's out here. Oh, for sure. Yeah, Glenn was Glenn was one of the first comedians. I Glenn had won the lottery and went to Denmark. Do you know about this? He won the lottery. Glenn won the lottery. What in Canada? Canada on a scratch ticket. He won like ten grand or something, and he'd been doing what comedy. In Canada. Yeah. He he was literally when I was there. He had done a workshop at one of the um, at the open mic on a Wednesday in Vancouver, is where I met him. Uh, he'd been doing it, and um, they the uh, one of the hosts said, "This is Glenn. He's really good. This is ninety. This is ninety six. This is okay. like November six. <laughs> and uh, Glenn, they said this guy just won the lottery on a scratch ticket, and he's off to Europe." So Glenn, I think, at ninety six, he I think he made it uh, a stuck it out in the in the UK. 
But did I don't think he lived in England first. Did he move to Ireland first? I went to Ireland in 1999. With, see, my big my big plan was to go to the UK, obviously, right? But I moved there. with I lived with an Irish guy down here, this young fella. He was into heavy metal, and then his visa ran out, and he said, he, he just said, I've been in bands for 20-odd years now, and I'm just, they're falling apart. And I'd started comedy, been doing it for three years, but I always knew I can't get good here. It's not enough work. You can't join the Olympic team if you're only swimming team, if you only go swimming Wednesday afternoon. You know, you've got to get – and I saw Bill Bailey in the small club here, the, you know, the English comic, and I just went, I've got to be around guys that good, right? So I just – my Irish buddy, he goes, well, I'm go I have to go back. He goes, you should come. And I had a UK passport, and I went, right. But I didn't have 10 grand. I had 500 bucks and two phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to Ireland, and I stayed out in the middle of Ireland, did a couple of gigs in pubs. We set up ourselves, did some open spots in – in Dublin, I used to go across to England on the ferry and try and do five minute open spots, but really, and stay on this woman's couch that I'd met through Julia, Julia, you know, Julia from Jonglers Chambers, Julia Chambers, who was going out with the Aussie comic Trevor Crook, and stay on her couch. And she and a friend of hers, and I, and I realized this is not going to pan out because, because, <laughs> you know, I've got, I'm 38. I thought, yeah, well, I'm 33 at the time, but I've come over and I'm staying on a couch and they, I'm ringing up out of the, remember the book they used to have? What was it called? The, the Like the... Rectory of comedy venues or... No, no, no. It was the, like the street thing and it had music in it and comedy and you could ring up, you could, I had all the clubs in it. I can't remember the name. It was one of these mags. And I'd ring up and I'd go, do you have an open spot? They'd go, yeah, August. I'm like, uh, but, yeah. but, it's, but it's July, right? Yeah. And so, so I'd get a couple of gigs like this and then... I thought, this is not going to work, you know. So I went back to Dublin and I thought, maybe I should just stay. And then by that time, I'd moved in with the guys from Primordial. So I, so I, could, I was in Dublin. I wasn't just in the countryside, right? And so then I thought, well, I should probably start in Ireland because it's easier. So people are going, do you want to get do, do this gig? They, they're giving me some paid work. And do you want to come do this festival in, Kil in Kil 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 Kilkenny and stuff? And I was well, I can get around Ireland, you know. I'll just have That's to maybe – well, you know, and I couldn't, I just couldn't, I couldn't do London straight off. But here's where the Glen Wall thing comes in. They stuck me in a Dublin comedy festival. Suddenly they go, you're doing half an hour with this Canadian guy called Glen Wall. He's got half an hour, you've got half an hour. So then we, he turns up in Dublin. We go to meet each other. We both got leather jackets on. I remember he goes, he thought we got to get on like a house on fire. We hit, <laughs> we hit the Guinness. We do the, we do the gigs and he goes, I'm living with an English a comedian in London called Neville Reynolds, and uh, he's got a spare room. You should move in there. I went, bang, I'm in. Right? Yeah, yeah, Canadians are great, man. Like all the characters that, like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I've put it in a on a shelf in my mind. But the years that I lived in London, specifically in Cranley Gardens, at that time, that <laughs> house, and people, there was like movie stars were coming into that that drug den. <laughs> That house was a part. You want to hear the weirdest story about that house? Why does in Cranley Gardens, which is that street where that serial killer lived, right? Yeah, on the side, a block up. A block up. That was just, I, whenever I'd come down from Manchester, I'd stay there. Every comedian went there. There was massive parties there. Then when that house finally fell apart, I started going out with this South African chick right, called Marley around 2013. Suddenly she goes, I'm going to my friend's house. They're living in this house. This is where Dad Crouch and she lived up Finchley, East Finchley there, right? You're not going to believe it. I go, really? She goes, where is it? She goes, oh, it's in Cranley Gardens. I went, you're joking. She goes, I go, what house is it? So she went to the party, took photos. Oh, it was the same house. Now instead of comedians, metalheads had moved in. <laughs> to a huge party house. With metal that heads. house was beautiful. Yeah, it was great fun. It was great fun. There's a bunch yeah. of things we talk about on this but yeah it was a great time it was, a, it was it was total chaos it was close to being in a movie about an animal house like when right. a, you know you got Kirshen, duty duty's wife phil nickel carrie marks myself duty's wife yeah like it was it was wild and, and anybody I, who stayed there Anybody who stayed oh, the there. Living room, the living room was like a bus station at Kandahar. It was, it was. <laughs> and you had Ed Burns' brother, Ed Burns' brother, Paul, who's passed away yeah. now, sadly. Such a legend. 
And uh, I, we'll put it like this, folks, so they get flagged for glorifying specific things. The lounge had huge velvet drapes. Remember those things? Which was very handy for blocking out the light. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, for late night movie, I don't know how many times I come home, people were uh, tripping and watching <laughs> Ernest Goes to Camp. <laughs> Glenn Ball got into Ernest Goes to Camp all the time. They watched yeah. all of them. There was like 13 of them, and they watched them all. Uh, he was yes. thinking, I think, so anyway, I'm sure my audience has an imagination and has had their own uh, adventures into a certain thing. So you can imagine. I'm sure you've all had, many of you out there listening, you've had your own houses of ill repute, shall we say. <laughs> Fun times. So so obviously 2006, you turned up to the UK, and then you started doing that when the Jonglers is rocking. And the Jonglers, by the way, folks, is a comedy uh, franchise, really. It had like 20 yeah. clubs around the whole UK. Taught me a lot, Jonglers. Oh, it was great. It was great. And I really got to like a lot of the staff in all the clubs. They were all very cool and happy to see you. And um, I, uh, there was, yeah, there was like 20 clubs every from Newcastle down to Portsmouth. Yep. And everything in between. And uh, you would show up. It was usually attached to an outback, right? Like, a, a, what was the Australian pub? That oh, they had there. a few, few of them to the walkabout. A few of them attached yeah, to Yeah, they had walkabout deals. So some of the, so there was a decent, you get some good pub food and, and uh, the shows were run. They had security. And I just like the idea of, a, of that. It's the first time, you know, in Canada, there's no bouncers at a comedy club in Canada. It's just like, the, you got to get the ticket girl to throw somebody out of the club for heckling. You know what I mean? Like it's where they had headsets and, those guys were on the ball with dealing with uh, nuisance to the show and stuff. And they were well, to, uh, to explain were, to the uh, listeners, we'll tell you what it was. <laughs> it was why it taught me a lot. It was, it was mainstream. So they used to call it chicken in a basket comedy. Remember? Yeah. Because, because I liked it. I liked it, mate. It taught me tons of stuff, right? Because I used to be really deadpan. And then, so what it was folks, they had like a big chain and you'd get, Mainstream people and groups, Christmas parties, birthday parties, people would come. They'd order a food, hamburgers, English, you know, chicken in a basket, fish finger sandwiches, all posh stuff, right? Then then you'd have the comedy, and then after that, they'd have the the, the, the music, the disco, and we're going to play ABBA and AHA, and everybody can dance, right? So they, so you're going to get hen parties and bucks nights, you know. The nights you'd go out, there'd be tons of chicks with, with dildos hanging off their heads and rabbit ears and flashing lights and all this kind of stuff. So not your perfect comedy crowd, which was great because it taught me tons. I remember in Nottingham one night when I used to be quite deadpan and one-linery, and then there's like 600 of them there, and they and I'm doing one-liners and that, and I thought, I don't think this cuts it anymore, one-liners. Great thing to learn for timing, deadpan, one-linery, but I thought it doesn't really cut it with trying to rail in this huge – 600 room chaotic party i'm going to stop the deadpan <laughs> nottingham jongliers was the only comedy club i've ever been fired from oh that's right <laughs> that's right for, 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 for upsetting that that party of people yeah and, and Julia had called me and congratulated me on moving up to the top of the list for complaint letters exceeding Jim Jeffries. It's sort of funny. They complained about Jim and he went on to become a superstar. <laughs> yeah. They, they, uh, she paid me like for the weekend, but they, the, they had a new manager that had just started and he never dealt with an entire left side of the room filing complaints on a company due um but yeah nottingham jonglers it was a nice club it was a nice club not oh, the best one but it was a good one i got i got because remember sometimes you get those christmas runs where you got like some guys will get 24 days and they'd be there in the same club for 24 days right i usually got grand, sorry about 20, they make 20 grand doing christmas shows over two yeah. weeks and yeah uh, well, I used to, I, my longest runs were like 10 days or something. Mm. I mean, it was brutal. You're stuck in Leicester for 10 days. It'll, you know, there was nothing to do at night, but you got 20 minutes at night. You got 10 days in Leicester. Right? I was doing Birmingham once or something for 10 days. And then I, like you, told a bunch of people who were heckling at that what they can do yeah. in, in, in no uncertain terms. And then the next day I just got the phone call. 
Uh, Steve, which I was relieved actually. What I'd have to stay in Birmingham for Christmas for another day. I back to Manchester and watch the X Files and chill out. I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get the helicopter. I gotta go. <laughs> no, the the best was watching Al Pritcher and I bomb in Newcastle at the hyena. Oh, over the Christmas holidays, they brought out the food. Uh, like two hours late to the tables as soon as the show started. People were still screaming at the staff. Al's standing on stage like, what am I doing here? And I still had to go on. He goes, don't get comfortable, Rouse. You're next. I'm headlining with my head. Like, yeah, no, a holiday. I A long time ago, I literally put a big red X on December. All uh, the way up to the middle of January. Man, I... I uh... To explain to you folks, when you do Christmas gigs, it's people who never go to comedy now at Christmas gigs in large groups because maybe one chick who works in, in in the office says, I love comedy, I'll book the Christmas thing, and then they bring 30 people from an office to a comedy club, and now they've got tons of groups of them, and they've been drinking since three in the afternoon. And and the, the, I did one in... Volatile. Yeah, volatile. And I, this wasn't a jonglers, but I did one that was like Bournemouth or something. I'm down there for five days. Every night was just one night. This is when you can still smoke in clubs. I just, I'm just dying. Nothing's working. And he realized it's not going to work. You can't pull this rabble rousing chaos into any kind of thing. They just started throwing roast potatoes at me. Right. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I just, I just sat on the stage. I thought I'll stay here for me 20. I just sat on the stage against the back wall and I'm smoking cigarettes and like Yorkshire puddings out just going, bink. Bink. <laughs> Bink. <laughs> just no. In that moment, you're just like any performer having a bad day. You think you're the first person to have potatoes thrown at you, Steve? Nah, nah. History of stage perform a lot. First of all, potatoes are a great way to get someone's attention. Yeah, fantastic. Also, this is why. Let's get into a sort of. In this sense, this is why you don't want PC and you don't want the state looking after you and going, oh, no one should ever be upset and be in a safe space. Do you think we should ban heckling? No. No. Yeah. Right, right. Why? Because this is this is good for you. You don't want it all your life, but if you're getting heckled all your life and getting potatoes thrown at you, you're probably not a good comic. Yeah. Right, right, right. But, but at the beginning, you don't want the state coming in going, well, you can't have that kind of abuse. Yes, you can. Throw your Yorkshire puddings. Learn how to stand there in the hate. Very important. Stand in the eye of the tornado. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know what I mean, be the storm. Oh, mate, and, and you know, I know if, if you want to put in the comments and I'm talking too much over my guests, but in this topic, you have to bring it up. I once did a, when I was in Ireland and I came all the way over on the ferry and I was doing this thing in King's Cross called The Church, right? But it was in a huge hall in King's Cross on a Sunday and it was for Australian and Irish and New Zealanders who lived in London, right? It was called, it was called The Church because you could ring up your parents and go, did you go to church on Sunday? Yeah, I went to church on Sunday, right? A little joke there, right? I turn up. I, I, I've only been doing comedy about four years. I've only been in the UK. I'm still living in Dublin. I've come all the way on the ferry. I get there. There's, 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 it's like a thousand of them drunk in the afternoon in a hall. I'm, in, I'm backstage yeah. with the stripper and her mum. Yeah. Right? The stripper's going to go on. Right? I've got to go on after that. I'm still doing one line of deadpan jokes right to this rowdy thing. I'm just already sitting there like this. I'm so dead. I, I already know I'm dead, right? I can read this. Yeah. I'm dead. This, I'm not going to pull this together, right? I've gone out there. It's just death, right? There's just yelling and this and they've watched strippers and ACDC's been on the PA. I'm standing there, right? Everyone line has fallen apart. It's just, and, you know, and you, I'm not that experienced. It's pure, but I'm not leaving, but I'm not. I'm going to yeah. stand. And I look down. And this guy jumped up on the stage and he grabbed the mic. He goes, can I have the mic for a sec, right? And I went, I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in a loss now. I'm just in this sea of hatred, right? And I just, I just give it to him. And this is the word. He goes, come on, everybody. Give him a chance. I'm like, no, oh. don't, 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 don't beg for forgiveness. Don't beg for mercy. Right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, don't help me, mate. I'm just going to stand here until the, till the promoter comes on 
like he did, put his hand on my shoulder, went, get off. Oh, thank God. Right. I mean, I, t- I then, they then, they then finished it. And I had to get, I had to get to King's Cross. Someone was giving me a lift. I had to walk out with the crowd. Right. Mm. I, one, of, one of the guys, the guy who was MC and gave me a lift. I, I carried his guitar and I just ran to his car and dived in and just <laughs> like lay in the back seat. Get me out of here. Right. <laughs> you be turned into a scared toddler. Just put a blanket over me and just <laughs> let the burn. Um, Total. Yeah. Death. I had a meet Tony Law and I had a gig at the Hackney Empire for a charity event. And uh, I, I couldn't have bombed harder. They were pissed. They were pissed. There was a popular British rock band that were the headliners at this event. Pretty Things? No. Um, Tony, anyway, they were huge. They were blowing up, blowing up in, uh, in, in the UK at that time. I want to say around the time that the Libertines. Yeah, it sounds uh, like that kind of, it sounds like that kind of Manchester-y band. Uh, yeah, Something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they hated us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was all excited. The best part about the Hackney Empire was the photos because you couldn't hear the booing. They hated us. It was brutal. But yeah, I had a, I had gone into a Old Street Station. Had a black a Kojo had a black comedy night or for years down there. And the bouncers told me I was at the wrong club and I was the headliner that night. <laughs> <laughs> my mate took me from canada who's this jewish guy holding on to his backpack scared that we're in front of a back comedy club and then when the guy oh first of all he nudges me and there was all spelling mistakes on the sign <laughs> next to the bouncer so he's trying to be all a uh, hard at the door and he's standing now next to a clearly somebody with dyslexia had written handwritten no uh blah 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 or whatever uh, invite only type of thing but anyway they had to get the promoter to let us in the club and the guy was just shocked that uh i was actually performing there never mind headlining uh, oh man i you know it, it, i love i love deaths on the stage stories russia had, bombed on television. moscow bombed mate in moscow yeah on television i've got a television it, one too tell me this tell me this well I get a message direct from a um, comedy event that's happening in Moscow. They're taping three nights. They're doing four Russian acts on the Friday and the Thursday, and then four Russian acts on the Friday, and then the international acts on the Saturday. I had to go in, get a visa. They fly me in. I'm going to be there for three nights, and we're taping on the night before I leave. And... Um, there's a lot of back and forth about when I'm being picked up and what time the show starts. We finally get to the venue. There's water, pools of water on the floor. People are sitting on chairs and like, there's like an inch of water on this concrete floor. Wires all crisscrossing the venue. It was the most, It was I want to say gangster, but it's Russia. Everything looks gangster to a North American. And the show, the room was freezing. It was like, everyone was... Like this in the in the venue, right? And I'm like, how long have you been sitting here? And they're like, oh, just about an hour. And I'm like, oh, God. I go, when is this going to start? And they're like, we're going to try and get it off going in about 50 minutes. So I go, they're going to be sitting there for probably about four hours before I hit the stage in a cold room with no drinks or there's no bar. It's a TV studio that was looked like it was in a, uh, a, a rocket silo. And um, I recognize one of the guys on the show it's a Swedish comic and we're kind of looking at each other. <laughs> when, you're, when you already know just, that, that it's going to be a disaster. I was hoping that I would get them on the gravy train and this woo them, you know, in the air and then get out before they landed type of thing. I knew it was a short sprint. And if I got them on the Jason Rouse feeding frenzy, I could get out of this with some skin in the game. And, um, they, uh, first of all, they had a two-piece rockabilly band that would play the axe on. So the stage was in a, a kind of U-shape, and at the far end, they'd light the band, and they had these long, like, like skunk tail haircuts and stuff. That I, these, these guys are very famous uh, musicians here in Russia. 
They're very popular. The rockabilly. You like rock? No, I don't like rockabilly. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be around Brian Sweatzer. So the show starts super late. They finally get the first act on. He struggles. And I mean struggles where there was clearly, I noticed, a language barrier. And I thought it would kind of work itself out because some of the guy's timing might have been not adjusted to the Russian kind of translation. You know how they're doing English isn't a second language. So you get the ha ah, ha 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 and then the clapping afterwards and it fucks with you. I yeah, thought yeah. there would be, some, I could watch enough to make some adjustments. Well, not the case. Not only that, these assholes these <laughs> two, <laughs> with these guitars, the rockabilly guys, they're talking on mic. In the whoa, 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 while I, I'm doing stand up, they're in the dark ta- having a conversation on mic to each other while I'm going through my set. And I'm like, can we shut their mics off? I thought I was, I was being, I thought I was being punked at one point. I'm like, I flew all the way to Moscow. So uh, Dumb and Dumber here can talk through the mic. Is there anybody on the board? Like, it was, a, it was brutal. It this was is... brutal. <clears throat> they were just like embarrassed for me. And I was, was embarrassed this... for myself. This makes my one look like fun. I mean, we've all had countless ones, but that's that's brutal. Because you know, I know, I know, doing trying to do comedy and that to sometimes to just sort of Eastern Bloc people, their whole sense of humor is so different. The timing is so different. That what they find funny is so different. I managed to work out the Dutch and that eventually. That's that's why I used to go and die. Oh my gosh! All right, and then Bob, every night, every night at Tumler's, every oh. night, bomb. And you had a joke that I'd heard in the clubs in uh uk about the dutch yeah they'll stare uh, at, stare at you till you cry you were the first person to say that uh uh first person to mention bmx which my ears went up you had a bmx joke about um them driving in the canals yeah 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 on, the, 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 but uh um yeah but they you say they stared they wouldn't even be angry, and they did. They stared every night, and a, a group of Brits that see me at the Comedia six months earlier were dying laughing. So we're laughing at each other, at, at the Dutch people staring at me because they saw me at a great show six months earlier in front of a sold out crowd yeah. and dying on my ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. I died that, on that, TV in Canada on French Canadian TV. Oh, during the Montreal Festival? Yeah, they drove me over to that side of the town where the French people like to hang out. I've never done comedy with the French, and I don't know if I'd be able to. And went on their TV show and just not a snicker. No. Like, sometimes you're dying, but there's a bit of, there's some energy. This is. No, French Canadians are like Dutch people in that way, where they'll just like, they'll just cancel your ass. Yeah. Right there, there you're fired. <laughs> you're just, now you're just leaning over their table while you're eating to them. Oh, they're, they're just yeah, it's, it's, it's oh, yeah. you know. So the point, yeah, the, no. the point of this, folks, is that yeah, don't ever let don't ever let the state make everything a safe space because because you know. I know if, if I ordered some eggs and I uh, at a cafe and stormed in there and I wasn't happy with them, started yelling at the chef, then the cops will turn up and arrest me these days. Well, that's what happens to us, right? Yeah. But I don't, I don't want that stopped. I don't want that stopped, you know, because it doesn't happen to me much anymore. But when you start, well, you've got to go through the, the, the wall of hate. Yeah. I had a lady spit on me in Liverpool. It was the most pikey shit <laughs> I've ever gone through in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I laughed she gave me the old gypsy you know what I mean? in the club at baby blue <laughs> brutal man we've had him back in the good days to, back in the fun days man I, I was trying to chat up a girl and this mother of two harks a gobber at mine at the in the bar <laughs> and i was like that's what I came here for. I don't need your applause. I need a, a gypsy curse on me. And a Ugh, you were disgusting. Oh, I used to die on that stage sometimes too. The stage always creaked. I remember it always go. And you talk, you'd say this is a nice. This is because apparently the footballers used to go there in the eighties and nineties, and, 90s, and uh, that was the party spot down the Docklands next mm. to the museum. Um, but yeah, I 
I couldn't understand. I'd always see it would be full. And I'd, sometimes they, I'd bomb. They'd boo my ass. It was, I'm just like, well, you guys paid to get in here. <laughs> Give me a chance. I'm really trying. I've done this well before. Yep. Give me a break. But yeah, they enjoyed really disemboweling uh, comedians at some of the oh, venues. Man. So anyway, so, so we've, run, we've we've rocked around the UK. Two thousand and six, you got there. So so yeah. then, when did you get out of there and hit LA? Well, I'd had a, a little bit of an interruption in early two thousands. I had um, an ex girlfriend call U.S. Customs on me and tell them that I was going to work illegally in the U.S. Now that put me in the early 2000s to pursue a ancestral visa, which brought me into England. And I knew that the ancestral visa was um, going to be for at least six years. And I can apply for a British passport because my grandfather was from Grimsby. So I was eligible. My grandmother's from Cork, which I found out when you get to Ireland, you should just keep your mouth shut about where your family's from. They left. And they don't give a shit if your grandmother was from Cork. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I uh, I knew that this I had a six year ban from crossing the U.S. Um, and that forced my hand into moving to the U.K. And when that visa expired, that six year period, I'd already acquired a immigration lawyer. So my lawyer pretty much said, you can't even go near the U.S. border. And I said, that's great. I'm going to go to Europe and go get my Ivy League degree on just as a journeyman comedian um, and um, see the world a little bit before I get into the the American dragon, you know, and just get on my knees in Hollywood and try and save some of my dignity along the way. Um, so I had moved in, in the beginning once my... Uh, eligibility, eligibility came up for my green card. I moved to New York and moving from London to New York, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're kind of really, the city of London is, is a really something special and uh, you get spoiled. There's a lot more history. There's a lot more. Um, I found that the European, the UK comedy circuit, a lot of us hung out all the time. Yeah, yeah, it was you great. Know, back there there's was a lot. Great. Yeah, it was great. I don't know what it is now and who the players were, but all my friends were super cool and hilarious, and yeah. no one was like no one was really complaining about. We were just complaining about how busy we were. That's because back we then you had to be funny to get work instead of getting crowbarred in there by some kind of equality equity uh, uh, quota, quota. You know, everybody was everybody was good. Everybody you was know, good. Everybody was good. You know, there was no like, I can't believe they're working that guy. You yeah. had to be a good comic to work. You know what I mean? And um, so um, moved to New York, 100 year old snowstorm record is broken. So now I'm in Brooklyn. What you uh This is, uh, well, I left 2000. I think I moved to New York like 2008. I moved All right, to... So that's a short stint in the UK then. You're only there a couple of years. No, sorry. I was there for um, almost six years. I was there from 2000... No, sorry. Yeah, I was moved there New York, I think, 2012. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Makes sense. So I'm in Brooklyn. There's seven feet of snow outside. The city's shut down. And I'm like... <sighs> And I just, I'm going to California. Like, I'll take, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm Canadian. I've just moved from London where it rains. And if you can stay dry, you can stay cool. You know what I mean? Where uh, I didn't want to deal with the commute through the city of New York with Canadian weather, you know, the snow and stuff. So I had decided you know what i'm just going to move to hollywood i know i'm not going to get the kind of traction or um performance level that i'd uh, i lived in la for 13 years i probably made uh 100 bucks <laughs> ten thousand dollars in doing comedy in hollywood in 13 years 
but that uh, wasn't the place. I was using that as every performance there was either at the Improv or the Laugh Factory or the Comedy Store. Those were the only clubs that were worth anything. The rest of it was these, quote, outside comedy clubs, the worst. No industry. There was no, you talk about getting out of Australia to be with seeing Bill Bailey and these massive comedians that are really good mm-hmm. and in clubs and stadiums and this and on TV. And they, they were really had a, a lot of skills. So, um, yeah, so I moved to LA like, yeah, it was like 15, 15, 16 years ago. And um, I hated it. I hated it. I really hated it. I came from the London circuit uh, with a sidetrack to New York. Now I'm in LA. No one's telling the truth. Everybody's got some weird criminal story attached to them and what they did and who they did it to and all the scumbags and talentless. There was countless times where I'd picture these comedians that I'd seen on the Los Angeles comedy circuit, Hollywood in particular, um, in a UK pub in Liverpool on a, on a Saturday second show and them doing what they were doing there, they would be run out of town. They would be beaten. They would be beaten. And, um, so that was very, uh, discouraging. I was like, where do you guys think this is going to work? This Hollywood bubble is like literally a bubble. I can't yeah, understand right. why you guys are re-encouraging this mediocrity and these, these people that are clearly positioning themselves to um, soullessness. Like, they, 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 it wasn't like they're being taken advantage of. They were cutting their own hearts out and handing them, please take me. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Oh, please make me famous. <laughs> I just want to be famous. That's why the suicides, or they end up in downtown in <sighs> District 9. Uh, in downtown Los Angeles, you can go online and look at any YouTube video over the last 10 years showing a drive through which is a n- c- nightmare. Nightmare. Anyway, I'm sure it's all going to work out, right, Steve? Is that what you said? I never had any... Just, hey, I'd, oh, love, my, I'd love to do it. <laughs> look at I'd, me, man. <laughs> work out right. <laughs> I'd love to do comedy in the States, but I never had any desire to run to LA. And well, also, you know, England back in the day when that club circuit was good, it, it you know, paid you a decent living. These comedy clubs in the US was very like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. You know, you used to run down to London, you do seven, eight gigs, 10 gigs over three days, you go home with 1500 quid. You know, they, know. They, even though they didn't put and- the prices up, they still haven't put the, put the wages up for the comedy clubs. For, God no, and if you were a good comic, they would do everything they could to make your schedule allow you to do three or four gigs. They go, okay, what time are you on there, Steve? Okay, he's on. The, he's coming out of the tube. We'll be there, and you'd come out of the tube. Yay! And you just remember, I was like, did I just do that joke? Because yeah. I just had gigs, and I and now I'm I went from opening one show, and I've now I've had two headline spots before I've gone to bed. It was fantastic, man. It was great. I was great. I saw the end of it, you know. Uh, um, that the being let go from the Nottingham Jongleers, the time I'd hit Los Angeles, the cancel culture and the all these movements were in full swing, and um, that was another thing that bumped me out. Was I went when I moved to New York? I was immediately hitting the circuit, the scene, and shows that my friends that were running and had moved out of the circuit and became professional. American comedians. Well, my introduction to the New York comedy scene was an epidemic of I bombed these kids. And I looked at them and I was like, they, I just remind you of everything that's wrong in the world that they're getting. They don't think that they've the absurd behavior. Every, is, everything they think is wrong in the world, not everything that's wrong in the world. Oh, that's the thing that made me laugh. I was like, <clears throat> you guys are here on mom and dad's money. Okay. There's no way that you can afford working in an espresso shop and afford an apartment in this part of New York. You know what I mean? It's not like, unless you're squatting or something. Anyway, (laughs) they were terrible people, and I didn't like them, and I was willing to go to L.A., at least for the glitz of it. And I love the idea of going to metal shows when it's like 
32 degrees outside in February, and I'm seeing uh, Scandinavian black metal bands. I went and saw Marduk. Marduk, and all, yeah. And the, all the Latino people, it was great because if you go to a show in, in Scandinavia, everyone's average age is, height is like 6'2". So I, I can't, yeah, I got to position myself. But if you're going to see a black metal show in California, it's all Latino people. No one's over 5'7". <laughs> so I could stand at the back of the room and see over the entire crowd. It was great. <laughs> so, so okay, was, so, sorry, so, so you hit, so, so, so how long are you in LA for? Too long. Too long, you know, I really, I'd, it was so bad that I was engaged to a girl in Sweden. Like I'd spend half my year in Los Angeles and then half of my year in Sweden. That's well, that, so, used, that, that used to be a great country too. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. Sweden's changed a lot. Denmark, Mate, Denmark. I know it has. I know it has. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Well, you, yeah, you, was, you used to really kill in Sweden. You did a lot of good stuff in Sweden. I I did just was getting ready to move to the U.S. and I had an offer. In fact, Jim Jeffries uh, canceled on a X-rated television show or a, a festival in Sweden. And uh, I, I when I went there, I loved it. I really loved it. You know. Um, and I knew I was into the music, you know, at that time when I'd moved to Europe, I discovered all these bands that had huge followings all over Europe that I'd never even seen. And now they're playing regularly in the, in this part of the world. And, um, um, I still love that picture of you and Gaul. But if you don't know who Gaul is, by the way, folks, he's the singer from a band called Gorgoroth from... They Swedish or Norwegian? I think they're Norwegian. Norwegian, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, he's yeah, yeah. So, I, the, Gorgoroth the are a very, are a very full-on black metal band who don't muck around. And if if they haven't got the word Satan in one of their songs, it'll be rare. And I was, we, I was at Varken. You were at Varken. That was us. Remember when I was setting up my tent and I heard you laughing, and I look over, I'm like, Steve. I ran into you at a metal festival setting up my tent next to yours. Out of all the 80,000, 100,000 people that were there, I pitch a tent. There's that laugh. Yeah. Uh, 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 and I think I took a, I got photos of it somewhere. You you were literally rolling uh, a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> you know. And then uh, Gaul, because Godseed, former Gorgoroth, uh, was the headliner and they had so many rotting sheep's heads on the stage that the stench because all those heads were in buckets in yeah. the sun and they fired them up on spits and when the wind would change direction it just sound like, smelled like a morgue that had been on fire all day but i remember distinctly seeing you and uh gall and i go oh can you guys do a reverse because you guys had you had your hair kind of saying there was some physicality. Well, but what then, happened? What happened all that weekend was guys kept coming up to me. I was just I went there with uh, primordial guys kept coming up to you going, "Oh, can we get a photo with you?" I'm going, yeah, they thought, <laughs> and I'm going, "Why?" They go, "We watched the show last night. It was great." And I'm just, yeah, yeah. I, I went, I, don't, I didn't do the show. Come on, you're that guy, <laughs> <laughs> you're that guy from Gorgoroth. I'm like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> Come on, it's you. We know. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, and you're gay. You're gay. <laughs> so eventually, backstage, because we go to backstage, it's just I ended up meeting the guys. So there's a photo. We'll probably find it. You sent it to me. I'll, we'll stick it up on the intro. Or something. I, I posted it and I said, because I remember, because you were being mistaken for Gaul, and he's, Gaul was being mistaken for you at, at certain points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are so funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never, I've never seen him smile. I've never seen no. him smile. So you have this joyous communication, and the other guy's Norwegian, clearly. There's not a lot of expression. Mm. But uh, when he acted like a fan of yours with the kind of the, <laughs> like that, and you're, you're pretending you've taken on his personality, it was so <laughs> funny. It, uh, that was a great weekend, uh, in fact. That was a great weekend. That was a great weekend. Yeah, uh, with the I, I, I got there with Alan from Primordial. We we got there. We were we had the backstage uh, sort of you know performers area for tents. There's hardly That's anyone there. 
That's where I met. You introduced me to Alan at that show. Ah, right. So I remember I set up my tent. I set up my tent. There's hardly any tents there. We're in the afternoon. Me and Alan just wander off. Okay, let's start drinking beer and hanging out and doing it. And then I meet the guys from Niflheim and we're hanging around. And then we went and saw. Ah, uh, yes. We went and saw bands yeah, and they I were playing. Niflheim. I love them. Right. And so. And so me, me and Alan, who, who knows if, you, if we stayed together, but we, we, I didn't get back to like six in the morning. And by the time I got back to where my tent is, there's another 20,000 tents. So I'm like, I just don't even know. where it is. So I, I just had to sleep on the grass and then wake up and hopefully I can find a tent. <laughs> Worst part is you pass out next to a fence and then in daylight you realize you were 10 feet from your sleeping oh, bag. Yeah. <laughs> You feel like killing yourself. <laughs> I stubbed my toe so bad at that festival because you know those barrier fences that they put in those kind of looping with the bars. Yeah. Well, the, when the legs come down, they they flare at the bottom. There's two pipes out, and I was wearing a pair of just flimsy running shoes. And I think I was fighting with my girlfriend at the time on the way back to the shuttle, and I kicked that post so hard. I thought I split my foot like a piece of lumber. Like my toes just went like that. I'm sure I busted it. And, and it was the worst. Hey, carrying your 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 pack hungover <laughs> festival. You have a shower. You can smell your nuts through your pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone like, said to me the other day, yeah, do you want to because they got they got knot fest on here at the moment or something, Pantera and slip knot or something. And I think my manager's huh. got something to do with him. He goes, because you want tickets? I was like, nah. I don't no. want. To, I don't want to wander in a festival as a punter. So it's, it's, no, get about it. You know, I don't even know if I want to go there backstage anymore. I'm like, it's, 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 if, if I can sit yeah. in the in band's dressing room and just eat their stuff and just sit here and just yeah, I'll, and someone's going to pick me up and drive me out of here, <laughs> maybe no. I'll go. Otherwise, no. Nah. So okay, yeah, let's, let's get back on track. So you're in. You're in LA. Lovely, wholesome LA, and but now, wholesome. now you're in Texas. Now I'm in Texas, Excellent. so I'm in I'm in LA, and uh, I've got uh, maybe about three months on my lease, and it shut down. This is about a month before Black Lives riots kicked off, which I'm living uh, literally a. Uh, a block behind the man's Chinese theater, where's where all the riots went down in Hollywood. So I was very relieved. I couldn't believe it. I'd rented an apartment in my hometown for the first time since 1991. And now I'm a resident in my hometown deciding on whether or not I'm moving to Las Vegas, Florida, or like Nevada, Florida, or um, I wasn't going to go to New York. And Florida and Vegas, but my friends of mine that had performed in bands in the in the late eighties and early nineties had always told me that the festival here was awesome and the city of Austin was cool, had a music scene, and I knew from my experiences living in England that music and comedy is always a it's an easy conversation between us between mm. the musicians and the comedians. So I was like. Okay, live capital music, uh, live music capital of the world. There's a comedy thing there. There's a bunch of clubs, and some of my friends have recently moved there. And I decided, without even having even stepped foot in the state of Texas, uh, to take up a uh, rent a place over the phone and then go right from the airport to pick up my keys. I went into my apartment, it's empty, no furniture. And uh, I've been here in Austin for the last three and a half years now, and I like it. But as far as comedy goes, th that's a whole different animal down here. I love the city of Austin. People are lovely. It's a gorgeous place. It's clean. It's friendly. Um, it's not like the rest of the state of Texas. In fact, I was told that the rest of Texas doesn't even consider Austin part of Texas. Yeah, right. Where all that hippie shit is. Right. They say it's the cherry pie with the blueberry in the middle of it, you know. Um, so it was a relief. It was, it was, I was still in show business, but I had all the luxuries and lifestyle of being in Canada. They had a similar kind of friendliness about them. And um, I've been here ever since. So, yeah, I've been doing uh, 
various shows around the city and stuff. But this is home. And as far as my career is, as far as Austin's concerned, it's the stand-up secondary here for me. The, most of it is the lifestyle and the people. Well, that's what it's I love to get onto because we've both been dealing with, uh, yeah, the destruction of comedy. You sent me a few of those things. Canada's an absolute nightmare. Scotland's just gone berserk. Um, which is, of course, it's a global agenda. You know, it's just, it's and uh, I did a little rant the other day. My hands, as you're explaining this, it makes it it, it, it elevates my rage to to like throw chairs through windows and like just kind of you know when people freak out at the airport and they got a taser with them <laughs> <laughs> that's how i feel all the time that's how i am all the time um so i'm one taser from like biting someone's nose off in a street fight <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know it's it's just you know you've, you've you've come after comedy yeah but look at it this way we're um, at an age now that we have perspective and we have none of the like they they're never going to go after your family for something you've done because they don't even know who your family is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I'm glad that comedy is a, such a big conversation. Um, but I think that a lot of the conversations about comedy are some of the dumbest crap I've ever heard in my life. So what, what's what's it like? What's is because Rogan's brought that club there. Is that is that is that? working do you get do you get work there is that is it anything special or is it still a sort of in-group thing it's it's a, it's always been an in-group thing you know yeah, right. wood came to austin you know it wasn't like a bunch a scene kind of came up through the city uh it was something that was kind of transplanted here um there's been you know division um and uh, it's not really like a comedy club. It's more like a cruise ship with airport security. It's beautiful. Yeah. And um, it's not as open door policies. A lot of people would. It's completely opposite of the store in London. Like, um, Well, what the store used to be in London. Yeah, it, what it used to be. I always make the, that from that era. Yeah, where it was fun. Where it was fun. Um but there's you got to look at it. It's the Seattle scene, you know. It's the grudge era of comedy. So there's anybody that thought about doing comedy during COVID um, has showed up here in Austin. So everybody's under twenty five and been doing comedy for two to five years. Well, so you must, got they must be masters at it. Oh, it's wild! It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> I am so like. I've done all my growing pains, you know what I mean? And uh, I've been at it for a minute. And when you see somebody that thinks they know what they're talking about and they're 25 and they've, they've seen enough podcasts that they think they got a grasp on it, um, I'm like, dude, you are like, good. I hope you're punished at every inch of your career by society and your peers. Well, I want to get I punished hope. by society anymore. Society's against everybody society's well not not against everybody it's against anybody who doesn't join in their into their psychological agendas and uh it's just very depressing yeah. well i love what they call cancel culture now that's just a soft word for fascism so you just want to destroy someone's life it's not cancel culture right yeah it's, it's uh, weird it's like neo-nazi yeah the, you know it's like it, it, uh it baffles me and um this this the amount of submissiveness that i see in canada and friends of mine that are good guys doing good comedy and risking their lives to perform at shows that could potentially turn into a riot or uh an assault death threats and and not only that from the public but from the government yet they're still the most successful touring group in the country and there's if anything they should be awarded for all that hard work <laughs> and the the people that the people that want to go he, he, they, they had uh, protesters in vancouver this weekend these this comedy they're like the primus of canada as far as comedians go three piece and um 
they had, the show was sold out. But the people that had bought tickets were so scared that half of them sat in a restaurant across the street and didn't go to the show. They just watched the protesters. So the protesters hijacked the good time of these people. They were too scared to come into the venue because they didn't want to be on camera as uh, a white yeah, supremacist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's what I meant. It's the, our, own, our own citizens are traitors amongst our midst. Yeah. Traitors. Yeah. Yeah, the traders. They, you know, they think they. It's 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 almost like that. You can feel the energy of the show drop, folks, because me, it's both. It's just, it's just yeah. because 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 we go back, we go back to when we were all working. See, nothing was happening. No one was getting hurt. No one was getting upset. No one. Not see. Now you're trying to protect everybody from stuff that what wasn't happening. Yeah, nothing was happening. It's wild. I think uh, once they started to. <laughs> go after bullies <clears throat> in schools uh it kind of you know castrated a, a lot of it, it changed somebody that was maybe like uh a very toxic male child and then put him in so many boxes and and isolated him so much that he had to if you can't beat him join him so you got a guy who's clearly should have been a navy seal is now have got pink hair and hanging out with <laughs> you know what i mean like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like taking that, that psycho and put him in the, the job that he should have been doing which was protecting other people so that they could have opinions but now he's been demoted down to protester when he right. should have been a mercenary and everything's see, every, everything's connected as far as I'm concerned. You know, these are my opinions. Uh, you can believe what you want, folks. But, uh, you know, they start with things like, as I said in my little rant the other day, they, they, they invert your compassion and use it as the idea that you're being moral. And then so they start with things like bullying. Now, of course, there's a valid idea about, oh, it's, it's horrible though if kids get bullied at school. Yes, it can be. Very horrible. Horrible. But life is strange. So sometimes the bully child could end up with great advantages through the bullying. I understand there can be a, 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 a want to sort of, okay, well, we can't have everybody, but to then everybody get, you know, obviously you don't want your child bullied. A child could end up highly traumatized or even often themselves. Suicide. Yeah. Right, right. Of course you try it. But, you know, this is, all these agendas have been brought to you by, by a, a, an authoritarian base it doesn't have your best interest at mind that's not the point they're not there they're not concerned about kids getting bullied they, they introduce it hijack your compassion and next minute they can start to merge it and it merges into other things like perhaps we can ban heckling perhaps we can ban this and perhaps we can and next minute everything's a safe space and everything's for your safety and everything so you don't get upset and everything and it all bleeds into each other and next minute there's your own citizens protesting a comedy show where no one's getting hurt nothing and who are you yeah, people you to tell these people that they can't go and laugh at these 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 grotesque jokes that you, you, you could do or, or, or provocative opinions. But so, see, they say people like me, are oh, you a controversial comedian, Steve? I'm not controversial. You're saying that men can get pregnant. That's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I, th I, I think people like yourself and now you, you're getting into the, uh, you know, the this p platform of podcasting and having long form conversation this is how you can take the power back in conversation. Well, hopefully or, or or i'll just move into the woods because eventually I've, i mean i've been ranting about this stuff for 20 years and you've got to stand and fight what would what would life be without a challenge steve well comfy fun yeah. you know i i don't always want a challenge you know i'm I, i'm not your fighter i'm not your guy to join the navy seal i, I just wanted to do comedy maybe point out a few things but if it gets too mental i go i just rather live in the woods mate get away get it because i never liked mainstream people when they were just buying stupid records and things let alone when they turn into absolute emotionalized landmine psychological foot soldiers ready to destroy my life i like again I don't see this is why uh, we were metal heads in that way. I don't like the establishment. I don't like bureaucracies. I don't want to do with it. Do you want to go up against the cops? No, I don't want anything to do with them. No, I, 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 you can't talk to these people. I don't want to be involved in your, your, your systems because they're so rigid and freaked out. I'm like, no, no, I, I'll have to disappear into the woods and hang out with 
That's why I never got into organized sports, specifically oh. hockey players. I never wanted to play hockey because I didn't want to end up being like those shitheads. <laughs> why don't you guys all wear different shirts? Why do you got <laughs> on them? Why is your ID on it? Just put the barcode on your neck and get the ball and go that way. I didn't want to. <laughs> like, you know what like, I mean? like that Sepultura cover with the guy with the barcode yeah. on the back of his neck, you know? Yeah. So talking yeah. about radical things, we, we've been going at this for about an hour and a half now. This is good. But you did a feature film as well, didn't you? Which is I did. Which is very interesting because it's 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 hardly a family friendly uh, romantic comedy, is it? Yeah. No. Look, it's it's not it's not like a Serbian film where it's uh, oh, yeah a yeah yeah film. it's not a Serbian film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, we're not going that mental. What's wow. what was this? What was this film called? That you did it's called the Serbian spare, film, spare parts, and um, a guy that used to come out to my shows. He was a young filmmaker in Toronto, and he explained to me that he would had some projects in development, and that one day he would uh, would like to put me in one of his movies. And from two thousand down to like, yeah, because that was like five years ago. I think we did it anyway. Cut to like twenty years later he's we're on set doing this film and um i thought i ruined it i really did i i I really struggled and um the first couple of days was a lot of adjustments for me i didn't like like i said i don't want to be a part of something i don't want to be responsible for all these people livelihood the longer i'm taking to shoot these scenes and if i botch this thing this is a big this is a butterfly effect all the way through this whole business whether or not I could pull this off. And fortunately, um, with some creative editing, it, it came out really nice. So I was very pleased with it. Um, and the director actually called me. I didn't even know who it was. It was from a, a number. I didn't, he goes, uh, it's good. We're cut, you, you did great. And I'm like, Whew. I thought I had blown it because I'd been on set all with seasoned actors and actresses. And I'm a club comic who's, in fact, one of the actresses told me, she goes, if you weren't the director's friend, you would have been fired yesterday. <laughs> I, no, I don't. No, I left a cup of piss in one of the girls' change rooms by mistake. And she found it. And the cup had heated to a degree where the glove glue on the seam had formed a little piss drip. So I got uh, yelled at the first day. It was bad. Anyway, did the movie. It's on Amazon. So, 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 so that's it's, 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 it maybe some people going. Well, well, what are you doing pissing in a cup? Is this from the old school? Because I've pissed in a few cups myself backstage when there was no bathroom and you couldn't get the. I knew, if anything, in this business, not to be late. So there was a, a first and foremost: show up on time and be prepared. And um, I didn't want to be in and have a stupid excuse why I was not on set when the call time and the sheet while well, I had a nervous piss before the show and the queue up to the toilets was not going to, and I can't go, can I go ahead of you guys? I'm the star of the movie. There's probably a lady in there probably with some diarrhea from craft services that might've not treated her well. And I didn't want to have anyone crap their pants. So I quickly stepped back into the, um, uh, trailer where we have our own individual rehearsal spots where you change and eat or whatever and um i decided to pee in a cup and put it on top of the uh coat rack and what i didn't know was i figured well this is my apartment for the whole time i'm here i'll just leave my stuff here and forgot the cup of urine on top well the next day i get called to set and i look at the I'm like, I thought it was this, oh, whatever, my name's on the door here. I go in, I hear the girl next to me screaming. And when I say screaming, she screamed my name, Jason. She quickly realized I wasn't playing with a full deck. And if anybody, <laughs> if anybody, I don't work a lot of union jobs, to say the least. Okay? <laughs> I don't have a lot of human resources coming down my neck because there's mm-hmm. nobody around. And, uh, she had uh, reached up to grab this cup off there to throw in the garbage and it was topped with urine 
And when she squeezed the paper cup, the glue that was holding the seam together had split and piss had just poured out down her hand. And um, that would, and anyone else would have been fired for something like that. But anyway, I end up doing it. I'm doing another film. I'm always playing like so what, killer. What was this film about? Because it's, well, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting scenario, spare parts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, you know, post-apocalyptic cult that works out of a local junkyard. And what they do is they kidnap people and um, do body modifications on them. All the girls had their arms removed. One of them has a, an axe. One of them had a saw and uh, kind of army of darkness. Uh, kind of things where they were all weaponized and they had to fight each other. One of the girls is pregnant. They remove the fetus from her while, while she's unconscious so that she can fight. And um, anyway, so fa family, I, family, friend, fa family friendly rom com. It's it's terrifying, and these poor girls have to uh, kill each other and in turn. Uh, uh, in fact, do you know the movie Hardcore Logo? No. Oh, it's up your alley. I'll send the trailer to you later anyway uh rock it's kind of like the runaways meet saw so joan jett if she was in oh the yeah movies, i don't like these saw films i'm not one for torture porn uh, uh, i never have been uh, no well it's it's not more the torture aspect of it it's more of a, a classic slasher movie uh you know the rubber head gets cut off and it squirts it has a, a grindhouse element to it it, when I say saw, I mean some of the the kills and uh, murders are are pretty explosive, but it's not like where you feel like you need to go have three showers after. Oh you yeah, watch. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not. No, no, you're a sensitive, caring person, Steve. I am. Life. No, I believe it. And uh, I mean, I you know, it's just I don't know. I just grew up with. You could tell the difference, the change in horror films. It was kind of like you, you, you know. The Hammer Horror stuff was just the vampires and the, the the Dracula and all this and that. But see that I think the first one that turned it into into realism was like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? Which was which was now it wasn't just a monster. It was what well this this could happen to you. I mean, and, and that film will make you want to have a shower. You know, it's grotty. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, we've all we've all broken down in the middle of nowhere, and you've looked around and go, "This is how these movies start." Right, and just when you watch that film, it looks there. It's 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 sweaty. They're all bleh, that. It's just you, you do. I know a lot of guys who I watch these channels that do reviews of horror films, and they go, I, "Whenever I watch that film, I have to have a, I have to go and have a shower." You know, it's 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 still oh, got yeah. it's still got that feeling about it. You know. Yeah, I I there's a couple of things that I've seen movies and various nightmarish clips, and I always felt that that night. At the morning after I'd been exposed to those kind of horrors that there was, I did feel a bit of my soul ache. There was something that was kind of a hook in my heart from going, yeah, that, that, that can happen. That yeah. was, that yeah. was, it's uh that's not good. <laughs> so, oh, I get to that stage. Yeah. This is, yeah, a, so, 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 so. With our, with our, I, I, it's funny. I wanted to bring it out of the bit of the doldrums of how, how we're looking at the comedy scene. We went straight into some film about guys hacking up cheeks to have, make them into sort of cyborg warriors. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, if you're interested, folks, Chase has done a film which is, which is over the top. Yeah. But so, what are you doing now, comedy wise? Because I'm, I'm, I'm apparently going to Europe in a few months, and you, you said you, I mean, are you, it's. it's you can't make plans I, like we used to, can we? It used to be go, right, um, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this. It used to be eight months in yeah, advance. Just now booked out. Months. Yeah, yeah. If months worth of scheduling in front of you, you're a hero on this time because – And there's just there's just a part of me, I've got to admit, this, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's just a part of me I just like – I used to be excited to get the gigs, you know, like like – you sorry? What? To I used to be excited to get to gigs. Yeah. And, you know, who would be there? And it's going to be great. It's going to be great energy in the air. And, you know, we're going to be. And now it just feels like this whole scene is just a. Because you don't respect it, the scene, because the scene is weak right now. Yeah, I don't respect it. So you, you're going to like, it's like being the biggest guy in prison. It's like. 
you know, everything looks like an Apple store in it with a genius bar. And every, there's, no, there's no genius and there's no apples. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I know. But then that's, you know. I think so without bringing where, you, without bringing you back down again, you you are hitting sort of uh, you hitting uh, Denmark, are you hitting? Yeah, yeah. So I start in, in Canada in April. I'll work my way across the country, come back to Austin for a couple of weeks in May, and then I'm going to go do a few gigs and go see Judas Priest in Copenhagen. Um, there's a bunch of bands playing around that month, and then um, you know I'd like to do some more i'd like to have at least half of my year in europe to be honest with you and i'd really almost like to devote a, a month out of my life to america like i only see uh, a month worth of gigs here in places that i'd hand pick and stuff but yeah i'll continue to chase it you know i always i uh, made a promise to myself and england was a big catalyst in that, that I decided every year that I was in comedy, I should go visit somewhere different, a different country and different things. So I'm you going to, Iceland, you going, you going to Iceland. There's a festival there the first week of June. And I was trying to get into it. It's called Satan Fest in I, in Reykjavik. Yeah. And it's all metal and fun. And our friends from uh, what's the Icelandic band, Solosphere. Yeah. I don't know them. I, I think they, they might I be. Know. A, I know I've heard of the uh, band. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. great Icelandic metal band. Oh, okay. um, anyway, um, Iceland will either be uh, during that first week of June. If not, I'm going to do an extensive European tour, which will include Poland and Germany. I think in uh, oh, okay, well, that's cool. Yeah, but I, I I definitely want to explore it. And again, I've been trying to get into uh, some sort of festival or touring in Australia, which I've never been. Um, at some point, if I next year, I'll be in Australia at some point. We should we should try and set it up if I can get a decent run here. We should try because because let's I, well, let's wrap this up, folks. I just want to say to you out there, if you've never watched Jason's comedy and you're you're sick of the boring, safe space, moany, just you know this tepid thing they call comedy out there. This this go if you never watched Jason Rouse, go you're in for a treat. If you want some if you want some provocative one liners and some <laughs> along the right. Anthony Jesselick kind of style in a sense. You know, you you and Jesselick have got those kind of dark dark Yeah. You know. I'm more of a a magazine was comparing comedians in that were related to metal. I think you might have been on that list, but the bands that they put next to us I can't remember who they did for you, but Cannibal Corpse, Jason Rouse, Cannibal Corpse of Comedy. <laughs> I, I looked up like that's it. The album cover, it's all grotesque. And then when you meet Corpse Grinder, he seems like a nice fella. He's a lovely guy. He he does toy runs for for, for, for kids who don't have parents. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. That's so I want to live my life like Corpse Grinder. Yeah. I want to do the most brutal, vicious, uh, unprovoked spire onto a room full of strangers they can count on that from me consistently even when i'm bombing i'm doing great yeah <laughs> and on that note that's a, that's a note to end on that's fantastic yeah all thanks right thanks for having me Steve. jason rouse the george corpse grinder fisher of comedy who's the singer of cannibal corpse so if you're interested in that kind of comedy which you should be these days because there's lots of tepid little fluffy. Turn it up. yeah turn it up this has been great, Jace. I've had an excellent time. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, Steve. And I'm, Australia next year. I, I think that let's let's put a pin in that one. Yeah, because, see what uh, we can do. See what we can do. Uh, we we don't know how much longer we have to travel, and we need oh, to get back to. The, yeah, you've got an audience that is. Uh, you got loyal fans. You've always had loyal fans. The minute that I, people found out that I was doing comedy, and I was in the metal. Do you know Steve Hughes? But they uh, it was it was Hughesy a lot. I could tell people from Oz they would call you Hughesy, and then the British kids would call you uh, Steve Hughes. You know Steve Hughes. Yes, yeah, Steve Hughes. Steve Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. This has been excellent. Talk to you soon. No worries, brother. Hope you enjoyed that, folks. Go and check out Jason's comedy. It's excellent.
Rock on.